tokens of encouragement when we get discouraged. Um, another token of encouragement is my friendship with Paul Nelson and his wife, Terry, and very good friends, ministry partners in many ways, growing as well, and uh, it's been a huge help to this ministry. And our friendship transcends just mere personal friendship, but our partnership with our sister church, along with uh, Dr. William Downing and Dr. Nelson as the pastor and assistant pastor, continues to grow, uh, and we just thank God for that. So will you come, Dr. Nelson, and share the word? things 
are spiritually discerned. You send your Holy Spirit to illuminate us, to convict us in the heart. So we pray, Lord, come. Bring your Holy Spirit to bear upon us as we study, study this subject of solifying through faith alone. Amen. In 1521, Martin Luther was sequestered in a castle in Germany. And during that time, he had access to Erasmus, second edition of the Greek New Testament. And as he was sequestered, he set apart himself to translate the Greek New Testament into German. The historian Philip Schaff said that this was Martin Luther's greatest work because it brought the teachings of Christ and the apostles into the hearts and minds of the German people. And in that great work, well, I should say, after translating in 1522, he traveled to Wittenberg, where he published that Greek New Testament, or the German New Testament. And in this great work of Martin Luther, in the text that we're looking at today, Romans 2.28, he added the word alone, that a man is justified by faith alone. And he was highly criticized by the Roman Catholic Church. For we know their sense of justification is completely unbiblical. They believe in, that a righteousness is infused into, into someone, as Brother Delco was speaking of, which in, assess, in essence results in a doctrine of works. That you have to merit and earn your justification by good works, by, by the Mass, by the confessions, and so on. And so they are highly critical of Luther adding that word alone. And Luther responded to the criticism of using the word alone. He said, if your pope makes much useless fuss about the word alone, you tell him at once, Dr. Martin Luther will have it so. Are they doctors? So am I. Are they learned? So am I. Are they preachers? So am I. Are they theologians? So am I. So I, therefore the word alone shall remain in my New Testament. And though all papal donkeys get furious, they shall not take it out. You've studied Martin Luther with somewhat of a fiery personality. And that's classic Martin Luther right there. Well, a few years later, the Catholics met, uh, met at the Council of Trent, and they declared that anyone who believed in justification alone was anathema, was cursed. So I ask you then, as we consider this text, was Martin Luther justified? In adding that word alone, we shall come back to this at the end of our message and try to answer that question. Our text states, therefore, in verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. It's a concise summary statement a conclusion of what has been previously said. That a man is justified, that is, he is declared and pronounced righteous before God, and this declaration is obtained through means of faith, and this declaration excludes any merits of man. It is without the deeds of the law, completely separate from the works of the law. Our text begins with 
Therefore, we conclude. It's one word in the Greek. Logizomatha. And here it means to gather up the reasons, to count them out, to weigh them out. And the context for this conclusion is in chapters 1 and 3 of Romans, where the Apostle Paul has labored to prove the condemnation of all men before God. That all are under sin, all are condemned, and the whole world is guilty before God. He has proven that there are none righteous, no, not one. That there is no difference between the Jew or the Gentile. The Jews do not hold a, a privileged position in the matter of justification. All are condemned. All are guilty. And then, in the latter part of Romans chapter 3, Paul explains to us in a very summary fashion how one is pardoned from sin. How one is acquitted of guilt and made acceptable before God. He calls this being justified or being declared righteous in God's sight. And he is crystal clear that this legal transaction cannot be earned by man, cannot be merited by man in any shape or form. Man is utterly incapable of justifying himself before God. He must have the very righteousness of God if he is to be accepted of God. So we come to verse 28. Paul says, Therefore we conclude, as we've noted, that he's gathering up all the things that he's laid down in his argument, proving that all men are guilty before God, weighing all these truths and their logical inferences, and concluding that a man is justified by faith, Apart from the works of the law, it can be no other way. So let's look at our text in two parts. First, the meaning of justification. And second, the means of obtaining justification. Well, what is then justification? A word that we hear so often? A word that's highly abused and misunderstand? Stand it, misunderstood, excuse me, and misrepresented. How would we define it? The verb translated justify, the kaiousthai here, in our text, it means to declare or to pronounce one to be righteous. It is a legal declaration made by a judge in a court of law. It is God who acts as judge, and he pronounces his verdict. And what is his verdict? The believing sinner is acquitted of all guilt and punishment on the ground of Christ's merit alone. And God declares the sinner righteous. Well, more precisely, justification then is a legal exchange a legal swap, if you will. A swap of Christ's perfect righteousness for the sinner's unrighteousness. In the classic text, a text that you should have memorized, is 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The guilt of our sin. He was made sin for us. The guilt of our sin transferred to Christ. Imputed to Christ. Put to his account before God. And he takes our guilt before God. And suffers God's wrath and God's judgment in our place. And God exacted his judgment upon him. He satisfied all the demands of his law. And poured out his wrath on his son. Who was in our place. Who took our punishment. He became, he was made sin for us. This is referred to as the passive obedience of Christ. And then on the other hand. 
Christ's righteousness is transferred to the sinner. It's put to his account. It's imputed to him. And Christ is our substitute. He obeyed God's moral law to perfection. And as the God-man, he was absolutely sinless. And he merited a perfect righteousness. And this is called Christ's active obedience. It's that positive righteousness that Christ has merited for us as the God-man. And this righteousness is imputed to the sinner. It's put to the sinner's account. It's a legal exchange of our unrighteousness and the guilt of our sin upon Christ and His perfect righteousness imputed to us. God acquits the sinner. God pardons the sinner because He views the sinner as completely robed in Christ's righteousness and fully accepted. God's holiness, God's justice, God's righteousness have not been tarnished in any way. His justice is vindicated. His justice is fully satisfied. And the sinner has been completely justified. This is the legal transaction of justification. And Paul refers to God being both the just and the justifier of those who believe in Jesus. He remains just without any tarnish to his holy character. And yet he justifies the sinner. Yet this definition of justification is not yet complete without highlighting three vital characteristics of justification. By grace alone, through faith alone, and because of Christ alone. These three characteristics highlight the source of our justification, the free and sovereign grace of God, the means of receiving justification, that is through faith, and the ground of our justification, the redemptive work of Christ and His atoning sacrifice. Our text before us today, in particular, underscores the means of justification. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith, apart or without the deeds of the law. Well, that's the meaning of justification. Let's consider now the means of justification. If it is true that a man is justified by faith, then it is vital for us to ask exactly what relationship does faith have to justification? And so in order, in order to answer this question, I want to consider eight things regarding justifying faith or uh, saving faith. First, the antithesis, that is the opposite, of saving faith are the works of the law. From our text, we see that saving faith is diametrically opposed to the works of the law. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That is a completely apart from the works of the law. This means that you cannot earn your justification in any way. Paul said in Galatians 2.16 that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith. He said in Galatians 3.11 that by the, the law no man is justified before God. And this, he says, is evident. It is manifestly clear. Paul understood that his own righteousness, which he characterized as blameless, as a Pharisee, he characterizes it as but dumb in the sight of God. Isaiah wrote that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags that it stains on a woman's mistress rag. 
The Apostle Paul knew that the only way to be justified before God was not having my own righteousness, he writes, which is but of the law, but the righteousness which is through faith in Christ. Christ's righteousness is the only accepted righteousness by God. We must have the righteousness of God, not the righteousness of man. And this is only obtained by faith. It is plainly taught by Paul that justification was by faith alone. And the Roman Catholic Church that objected to Luther's teaching that he should attach this word sola to fide. <coughs> they objected to it, for they believe that a man is justified before God, that he must merit his justification by good works. But the word of God is clear. It is by faith alone that sinners are justified. Well, secondly, saving faith is the instrumental means by which the sinner appropriates the righteousness of Christ. In our text, it says that a man is justified by faith. Well, in the Greek, it is piste, the noun faith, which is in the instrumental case. And here we see clearly that there is an instrumental relationship between faith and our justification. Faith is that instrument that receives and grabs hold of the righteousness of Christ for our justification. It is the divinely appointed means of appropriating the righteousness of Christ. Well, in addition to the use of this, the instrumental case of to stay for for faith, the New Testament also uses two different prepositions to convey this instrumental idea. One of the prepositions is dia, which means through, used in the genitive case. And when it's combined with the noun faith, it is through faith. It stresses the fact that faith is the instrument again that appropriates the righteousness of Christ. An example is found in Philippians 3.9 where Paul says, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but which is through faith in Christ. The other preposition is ek, or out. When combined with the noun faith, ek stoos, it conveys the sense of faith as, again, as the appropriating organ which receives, which grabs hold of, which makes it your own. An example is found in Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting that we must note also that Scripture never uses this preposition dia along with the noun faith in the accusative case. Because if it's used in the accusative case, it makes faith causative, that you are saved because of faith. That faith it merits one's justification. And that would be exactly opposite of the meaning of our text in Romans 3, 28. Faith is not the cause of our justification. Christ alone, as Brother Delcourt so wonderfully preached, it is only Christ. Christ is the very ground of our justification. Christ is the cause of our justification. It is Christ that merited and earned our justification. And no one else. An analogy of the instrumentality of faith is that of a beggar's empty hand held out to receive a piece of bread. Can the beggar say that he earned that piece of bread? 
No. And we can call faith the beggar's hand. Not because it earns justification, but because it receives, it appropriates, it embraces the righteousness of Christ. Third, saving faith, as we've mentioned, is not causative. And what I mean by causative is that our faith cannot be the cause of our justification. That is Christ and Christ alone. In today's decisionism and contemporary evangelicalism, faith is held out as the cause of justification, as if one is saved because of their faith. And the glory is given to man's free will that they chose Christ and are saved because of their faith. No, it's not faith that saves, but Christ who saves through faith, through the instrumentality of faith. And strictly speaking, it's not faith in Christ that justifies, it's Christ who justifies the sinner through faith. The saving power of faith does not reside in the act of faith. It does not reside in the nature of faith. But it resides in the object of faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by faith we embrace Christ for our righteousness. So we do not make faith a condition for justification. All the conditions of salvation have been fulfilled by Jesus Christ in His active and passive obedience. Salvation is all of grace. It is entirely of God. We can lay no condition for salvation on man. We're not justified because of faith, again, but through faith. Let me beat that into your head. Faith is not a work. It is not a merit. It is not our effort. It is not our ability. It's just the opposite. It's renouncing all works, all human effort, all human ability to receive the perfect righteousness of another. Faith empties itself and does not boast of any merit or good or work in itself. If we make faith a condition that the sinner must fulfill by an act of his own will, it is tantamount to saving himself. We make faith the condition and ground of our justification, then salvation becomes due to human merit. And when we mix grace with works, it's just another version of justification by works. For Paul says, if by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You can't mix the two. It's one or the other. Fourth, saving faith is the gift of God. It is expressly declared in Scripture to be the gift of God. For by grace we are saved through faith, Paul writes, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And again, we're told in Philippians 2, 29, it is given on the behalf of Christ to believe on Him. And who is mentioned as the author and finisher of our faith? The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Faith is a gift of God. Amen. And Christ Himself tells us that faith is the work of God, not the work of man. Christ says in John 6, 29, this is the work of God, that you believe on Him whom He has sent, meaning whom the Father has sent. That's the work of God, that you believe on Him whom the Father has sent. Faith is the work of God in the heart of man. Man does not have the natural ability to believe in Christ. Man is dead in his trespasses and sin. His heart is totally depraved. 
And he will never come to Christ on his own free will. Christ tells us that you will not come to me to have life. Man must be born from above. It's the Holy Spirit that grants the gift of faith in the work of regeneration. And this brings us then to our fifth point. Saving faith, justifying faith, is the result of regeneration. Saving faith is the inseparable effect of regeneration. Without regeneration, it's impossible for a person to believe in Jesus Christ. And there can be no justification without regeneration. In the work of regeneration, God implants spiritual life into the sinner. He imparts spiritual life. He renews the heart. He recreates the image of God in him. He breaks the power of reigning sin. He move, removes the natural enmity of man's wicked heart. He removes the satanic blindness of the natural man. And the effect of this supernatural regeneration, the consequence of regeneration is conversion, which is what? Faith and repentance. Faith and repentance. Saving faith is the effect of regeneration. It is only because the Christian has been given a new nature, has been recreated anew, that they believe in Jesus Christ. Consider Lydia in Acts 16, 14, how the Lord opened her heart. The sense in the Greek is that he thoroughly opened her heart, and she believed. Faith in Christ, the effect of the Holy Spirit's regenerating activity, brought saving faith to Lydia. And this work of the Holy Spirit is always in conjunction with the gospel message and the Word of God and the ministry of the Word. It is a regenerate person and a regenerate person only who believes in Jesus Christ. Sixth, saving faith appropriates Christ as its object. Let me just say this, the whole value of faith lies in its object. Faith is only as good as its object. And faith can only justify with Jesus Christ as its object. We are saved by a faith that lays hold of a Savior, lays hold of His, his blood, His atoning sacrifice, His perfect righteousness. And that's the cause of our justification. The object. Now if you consider saving faith, typically it's broken down into three parts. If you were to pick up a systematic theology, you find faith broken down into three parts. The first element of saving faith is knowledge. Knowledge, of course, is indispensable to saving faith. Saving faith must know its object. And Jesus Christ, as we said, is the object for faith. We must know who He is. We must know what He has done. We must know what He is able to do. There must be an apprehension of truth respecting Christ. We cannot say that we're trusting in a person or thing something that we have no knowledge of. That would be an absurdity. Faith cannot exist in a vacuum of knowledge. Faith has content. And faith without content is no faith at all. The Bible characterizes faith devoid of knowledge as believing the lie.
And although knowledge is absolutely necessary for saving faith, a mere intellectual assent to the truths of Scripture concerning Jesus Christ does not constitute saving faith by itself. It's possible for a person to know the content of the gospel, to have a clear comprehension of the truth of the gospel and of who Jesus Christ is, and yet not believe it to be factually true. A person can comprehend and know the doctrines of the virgin birth of Christ, of the resurrection of Christ, and know what it means and know what it is, but not believe it to be true. But you must have a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Faith without that, faith without content, is no faith at all. I remember talking to a relative of mine, and he says, all that's important is that we trust in Jesus. No more doctrine and the truth, that's just divisive. We just need to trust in Jesus and just love Jesus. And I said, well, who is this Jesus? Can you tell me who he is? Can you tell me what he did? And I brought it into the context of content. We must have an understanding of the gospel. So knowledge is a necessary component of saving faith. Well, secondly, there is the component or element of, con of uh, conviction. We must not only know the truth respecting Christ, we must believe it to be true. There must be an assent that these things are true. It's possible to understand the propositions of the truth of the scriptures, as we said, and yet not believe them to be true. But we must assent to the truth respecting Christ, that these things are true. And there must be a conviction that these things are true. So the sinner recognizes what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. It's real and it's true. And there's a deep conviction of truth, a deep conviction of the reality of Christ. Yet this conviction of truth Although necessary, a necessary component of saving faith does not completely constitute saving faith. Why? The devils believe in one God and they tremble. They know who God is. They know who Christ is. They understand. They have a knowledge of who Christ is. They believe it to be true and they tremble for they know that judgment awaits them. So it's not enough to have a knowledge of Christ, of who He is and what He has done and what He is capable and able to do and what He will do. It's not enough to have a conviction that it's true and believe it to be true. And that brings us to the third element of saving faith. Commitment. This is the element that really constitutes justifying faith. And this is the element that goes beyond knowledge and conviction. Many people have a mere intellectual knowledge, a mere intellectual faith in Christ, and it will damn their soul to hell. It's this commitment to Christ. Commitment to Christ. That's the crowning element of saving faith. An unreserved, wholehearted commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, the very object of our faith. It's the object of our faith that justifies. The sinner grabs hold of Christ as Lord and Savior. Not mere propositions of truth, but Christ. It's the appropriating of the fullness of Christ and his righteousness. The problem of Christianity today is that they have a knowledge of Christ and they believe that it's true, but there's no commitment to Christ. He's not your Lord. And so you have churches filled with nominal Christians who can go to church 
once a month and believe they're saved, who stay home and watch the Super Bowl, the baseball games, the football games. They don't care about Christ. All they want is to be saved from hell. And they look at Christianity as simply the mere forgiveness of sins. As I see the object of Christ, the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, it requires nothing less than unreserved commitment to Him as Lord and as Savior. How many of you talk to someone and says, Oh, you believe in Lordship salvation? Is there anything else? Amen. Is Christ anything less than Lord? Amen. No, they want easy believism. They don't want Christ to rule over their lives. They don't want to commit themselves to the Lord. They don't want to live and serve Christ. So they're satisfied with the knowledge of Christ, what He did, and that's glorious. And they're satisfied to believe that it's true, but there's no commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is not saving faith. It's committing the whole person to the whole Christ. Faith is trust in a person. Trust in the Son of God. Forty-nine times in the New Testament, the Bible speaks of believing in Christ. And in the Greek, it's a, it's a certain construction, bestuein ace, to believe with the preposition in, to believe in, to Christ. And forty-nine times, and it's pregnant in meaning. For it denotes an absolute transfer of trust to another. Faith is not simply believing Christ, it is believing in Him and on Him. And it's nothing less than a wholehearted commitment, self-surrender to God. And without this element, faith is merely intellectual. So the whole value of faith lies in its object. Faith receives Christ as its object. Faith justifies because it lays hold of Christ as its object. And the Bible portrays the activity of saving faith in very vivid language, figurative language. Coming to Christ, receiving Christ, eating of His flesh, drinking of His blood, these are figurative terms for faith in Christ. And they're very graphic. And the one I love, Christ stands up in the Feast of the Tabernacles in the temple, and He says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Amen. Come and drink. This is figurative language for faith in Christ. Seventh, saving faith is essential. When we say that we are justified by faith alone, we are divine, defining faith as the only means of justification. Faith stands alone as the only instrument that can receive the righteousness of Christ. Faith is the exclusive instrument, the sole instrument that unites the sinner to Christ cannot be justified in any other way. And thus we say faith is essential. John Calvin put it this way. Let it therefore remain settled that this proposition is exclusive, that we are justified in no other way than by faith, or, which comes to the same thing, that we are justified by faith alone. And although faith is neither causative, nor conditional, or meritorious in any way. Yet it is absolutely necessary for our salvation. Scripture clearly tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. There is only faith or damnation. There are only two states of man. Believing and not believing. A child of God or a child of the devil. There's no in between. There's no neutrality. 
When a man does not believe, he remains in a state of guilt and condemnation, with the wrath of God abiding on him. Our Lord said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So saving faith is essential. Finally, eighth, what is the warrant of faith? What is it that entitles the sinner to rest upon Christ? How does the sinner know that he will be accepted of God? How does he know that Christ is able to save? Well, we know that the warrant is found in the Word of God. The claims of truth that reveal, are revealed in Scripture. And Christ has revealed in Scripture to us who He is, and what He has done, and what He will do. And the ground and reason for believing in Christ, then, is found only in the Word of God. For He is able to save to the uttermost of those who come to God by Him. It is not the possibility of salvation that is offered to lost men, but the Savior Himself, and therefore salvation full and perfect. The gospel is offered to all men. All are invited to come to Christ. And it's the right and the duty of everyone to whom the gospel is sent to receive and rest upon Christ for their salvation. Indeed, upon hearing the gospel, there is an obligation put upon the sinner to receive Christ and to rest upon Him for salvation. Man is morally responsible to believe in Christ. He's made in the image of God. And man remains a morally responsible creature before his Creator. And Paul says in Romans 1 that he is without excuse. And he told the Philippian jailer, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In that verb believe, there is an aorist imperative, which means with urgency and with the determination, lay hold of Christ and believe on Him. And John writes, this is His commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the warrant of faith. And let me just close with this, that Mark gives a remarkable summary of Christ's preaching. Mark 1, 14, 15. Now after that John was put in prison, John the Baptist, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Christ demanded his hearers to repent and to believe. There is always the obligation to respond to the gospel. The warrant of faith then consists of the free call and the gracious invitation of the gospel. For if any man thirst, Christ says, let him come unto me and drink. And when man hears the gospel, he is obligated before God to repent. Now I'm going to go back to our question. Was Martin Luther correct in adding that word alone? That a man is justified by faith alone? If we look at the analogy of faith in all of Scripture, and what Paul is te teaches time and time again, and states vehemently that we're justified without the works of the law, yes. He's justified by faith alone. And so that rendering is based upon good and necessary consequences. For when Paul writes that a man is justified by faith without the works of the law, completely separated from the works of the law, he does indeed mean faith alone. That's the whole point of the Apostle Paul, to exclude works and merit and man's effort in any way. For he said, where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. 
So I agree with Martin Luther. Sometimes you have to add a word to make sense of the text, to accurately translate it. In the King James or in modern, modern translations, we find those words that are added uh, for an accurate translation are put in italics so we know it's not in the original uh, text. So maybe Martin Luther probably should have put a footnote or made that word, put that word in italics. Like, yeah, I would have to say that. Maybe he did. I don't know. I haven't seen the text. But I think it was warranted for him to add that word alone. And the Reformation followed on the coattails of Martin Luther's movement. Our Father, how glorious it is to know that we're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's not of works or any human merit. That salvation is all of God. All the sovereign work of God. And who are we that you would call us? That you would bring us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We are no one, nobody. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your kingdom. And giving us faith in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.